Chapter 8 is an introduction to metabolism. What is metabolism? We will get to that in short order. But first, let's go through the learning objectives. Here is the first part, and the second, and the third. Metabolism is all of the chemical reactions that are going on within an organism. Within the cells, that includes every dehydration reaction, every hydrolysis, and thousands of other reactions that occur. But, as ever, cells are orderly and organized. These reactions that occur are no exception. Biosynthesis is usually arranged in pathways, which are series of reactions that begin with one reactant, and through a series of enzymatic reactions, a product emerges. A metabolic pathway, at its simplest, looks something like this. The pathway begins with molecule A, over here, and ends with molecule D. And there are three steps from A to D. Each is catalyzed by a different enzyme. In reality, the sum of all chemical reactions is enormously complex. Many pathways and cycles occurring, and they're all interconnected with each other. Intermediates A, B, C, and D can all be used in other pathways besides the ones we saw in the simplified version. Broadly, though, we can divide metabolic pathways into two categories, those that build up and those that break down. Those that break down are called catabolic pathways. Breaking down of molecules releases energy as complex molecules are broken down into simpler ones. We've seen examples of catabolism back in chapter five. Hydrolysis, the process of removing monomers from polymers by adding in water. Cellular respiration, which is the subject of the next chapter, is another example of a catabolic pathway. Anabolism is the opposite. Anabolic pathways build complex molecules from simpler ones. To do this, anabolic pathways require an input of energy, just as we saw with moving molecules against their concentration gradient in the previous chapter. Dehydration synthesis is an anabolic process. You may have heard anab of anabolism before, or of compounds known to assist in this process. Here, once again, is oxandrolone. We saw oxandrolone in Unit 1. Do you recognize the shape? And, with the mother other material on this slide, perhaps the background image also makes more sense. Oxandrolone is one of many anabolic steroids, drugs taken by athletes to accelerate the process of building muscle mass. While catabolism and anabolism are both cellular processes, the former releases energy and the latter consumes energy. Energy is finite, limited, so cells need to carefully account for their energy credits and debits. Bioenergetics is the study of how cells manage their limited energy budgets. So this chapter is really about energy, so let's go ahead and refresh on that. Recall that the definition of energy is the capacity to affect change, and that many forms can perform work. For example, we saw how ATP energy could be used to produce a concentration gradient in the last chapter. Energy can be broadly divided into two types. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement, and that's movement at any level from the movement of subatomic particles to the movement of galactic clouds. Often we see kinetic energy expressed as chemical energy or the energy that is stored in different types of bonds. The second type is potential energy. Remember, that is the energy of position, kind of like the idea of energy that hasn't been used yet. And similarly, it can be expressed at many different scales. It is an important theme of this and the next two chapters that energy can be converted from one form to another. 
Consider a simple example of energy transformations and a happy one. You may go to the lake or the pool and demonstrate this for yourself if you haven't done so already. A diver on a high diving board has stored potential energy, its gravitational potential energy. Another diver converts their gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy as they dive into the lake. The diver in the lake dissipates that energy as he enters the lake, causing a splash and producing some heat as well in the process. The next diver, over here, she'd like to have another go on the diving board. And to do so, she'll have to use her muscles and exert herself to climb against the force of gravity. The study of energy transformation is called thermodynamics. And while it can be a very complex course of study, for our purposes, we need not delve into all of the intricacies. We only need to acquaint ourselves with first principles. In a closed or isolated system, total energy remains contained within that system. In an open system, energy and matter can be transferred between the system and its surroundings. The biosphere is, for the most part, a closed system with respect to matter exchange but is very much open with regards to energy. And living organisms are open in terms of matter and energy. The first law of thermodynamics is, don't talk about thermodynamics. Just kidding. It's the principle of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred or transformed. Well, Dr. Einstein said something a little bit different, but that's not really relevant to us as living things. But put another way, you can't get something for nothing. The second law of thermodynamics is don't talk about thermodynamics. Okay, so it's less funny the second time. Anyway, the second law states that every energy transfer is inefficient. This is the law that explains why perpetual motion machines cannot exist. Even stars, like our own sun, may persist for billions of years, but will eventually run out of fuel and collapse under their own gravity. Since energy can't be lost, see Law 1, we have to introduce an accounting tool to explain the inefficiency of energy transfers. This accounting tool is called entropy. Entropy is also called disorder, though maybe not disorder as you commonly think about it. It's kind of a more scientific Dis, uh, scientific disorder. Not like your mom could come into your room and say, this room was just cleaned and now there's like seven entropies in here. That doesn't work. So let's apply these two laws, though there are others, to a biological system, specifically a bear. This bear is eating sake, or raw salmon. Posh living for the bear as it consumes the salmon and uses the biological molecules to convert it into bear biomass and to give the bear the energy to run around and do bear things. Now, that fish was made of proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, as all living tissue is. But what does the bear do with it? Some will be converted from fish biomass to bear biomass, but the rest will be converted to less ordered forms, like carbon dioxide, and water, and heat. The authors were kind enough not to include a bear in the woods, so we don't need concern ourselves with other less ordered mass that may emerge from the bear. From big, complex molecules, we get smaller, simpler molecules. The bear has catabolized the fish. In biological systems, heat is often the main form that entropy may take. Heat is not a very useful form of energy. Sure, some of it may help keep the bear from freezing to death, but once that heat radiates away from the bear, it isn't doing the bear any good at all. Living organisms, whether they are warm-blooded or cold-blooded or no-blooded, you know, plants, fungi, prokaryotic organisms, they take the food that they consume and convert it to some useful energy and heat. Processes that occur without the input of energy are called spontaneous processes, though again, not spontaneous in the sense that they occur suddenly, more in the sense that they just happen without anything pushing the process along. A classic example is rust. Rust is a spontaneous process, though not a quick one per se. 
for a spontaneous process to occur, it must also increase the entropy of the universe. Or, put another way, it must deplete the universe of some potential energy. One of the fundamental qualities of living organisms is that they are ordered and organized. Cells can create ordered structures from less ordered materials, but in doing so, they also convert some of those less ordered materials with even less ordered materials. In ecosystems, energy enters as solar energy, or light, and it wends its way through until it leaves the organism as the much less ordered heat energy. One thing critics of evolution have said is that the evolution of more complex forms of life from simpler ones violates the second law of thermodynamics. However, this is not the case, because organisms and ecosystems are not closed systems. The Earth is constantly receiving additional energy from the Sun, and while an organism may decrease the entropy locally, the total entropy of the universe increases more to offset the local increase. So, what determines whether an event such as a chemical reaction will occur spontaneously or not? And how do we measure that? For a single reaction, we can measure the energy embodied in the reactants and the products and calculate the difference. The energy embodied in a molecule, the potential energy stored in its bonds and that is available for, for work, we call the Gibbs free energy. When molecules transition from starting reactants to products, we can calculate the difference in the potential energy or the change in Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is indicated by the capital letter G and the change in Gibbs free energy is called delta G. Capital delta is a symbol frequently used in the sciences to indicate change. Energy change is also contingent on all of the types of energy concerned, such as temperature and pressure. In a cell, though, we can assume that temperature and pressure don't change, but remain fixed. Another way to think of free energy is as a measure of instability. While instability has negative connotations in our daily lives, in physical and chemical and biological systems, Instability means something is likely to happen. Instability and potential energy are intimately connected. In a spontaneous change, the free energy goes down and stability goes up. When a reaction reaches equilibrium, the stability is maximized, at least at that particular temperature and pressure. Recalling that energy is the ability to do work or affect change, a spontaneous process can only do work when it is working, moving towards equilibrium. Here is a formula that can tell us whether a reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. I will not ask you to make calculations on this equation, though I do have a few things to point out. The first is, the key is this value, delta G. If delta G is negative, the reaction will be spontaneous. Why negative? For the same reason that if you want to buy something, your bank account goes down. What is the most stable bank balance? Zero dollars. Delta H, over here, is the change in enthalpy. What is enthalpy? Besides something that sounds a lot like entropy but isn't, enthalpy is defined as the total energy within a system, and that's the usable energy and the unusable energy. The available energy, that is G, the Gibbs free energy, as in, hey Gibbs, are you free for work? T, over here, is the temperature in degrees Kelvin, or just Kelvins. One Kelvin has the same magnitude as one degree Celsius, which is nine-fifths the magnitude of one degree Fahrenheit. Only zero in the Kelvin scale is 273.15 degrees lower than zero degrees Celsius. Why? Because at that temperature, everything, and I do mean everything, stops moving. As in electrons, protons, and neutrons. That's what makes zero Kelvins absolute zero. Not pretty much zero or water zero. Also, notice that T in this equation is the one term that doesn't get a delta. 
In other words, we assume that temperature doesn't change. Temperature is constant, which is fair because cells, as far as we know, don't have an organelle that functions as an oven or a refrigerator organelle. S, over here, is the amount of entropy, and delta S is how much entropy changes within a reaction. So this equation mathematically is not challenging. It's the equation for a straight line, y equals mx plus b. Conceptually, I confess that it baffles me, and I've been staring at it for years and years. So why am I showing it to you if I can't explain it perfectly well? The real point of you seeing this is to understand that a spontaneous reaction has a negative delta G, and non-spontaneous reactions have a positive delta G. Spontaneous reactions can do work, while non-spontaneous reactions require an input of energy to happen. Let's see some concrete, practical examples. In this slide, we have three examples of stuff happening. A diver diving off a diving board into a lake. Diffusion of some purple particles into a solution. And a chemical reaction where the covalent bonds are rearranged. Spoiler alert! This chemical reaction is the hydrolysis of glucose to produce carbon dioxide and water, which is also the featured reaction of Chapter 9 coming up next. The three upper images share something in common when compared to the three lower images, which you can see described over here on the left. In the top three cases, the agents the diver, the dense purples, and the glucose have more free energy or a greater capacity to do work or affect change, and they are less stable. Again, we need to think of stability as not being the good guy from a thermodynamic standpoint. So all three of these top situations can lead to the bottom situations via spontaneous change. For the diver, he's going to jump off the board and dive into the lake. The jumping isn't even all that important. He could just walk or even fall off the end of the diving board. Okay, hold on. I, I saw this video and it's the craziest flippin' thing. I have to share it. Kind of relevant. Watch this. Okay, so Mr. Clean starts off from a position of instability, and I do not mean mental fitness. He gets up some momentum on the swing, up into the air and into the pants. Forward roll and butt scoots with arm pumps. What is going on other than that is bananas and you should watch it again? Just as the diver goes from high potential energy to a lower state of potential energy, the system has become more stable. The diver is unlikely to fall out of the lake. Stable. Same case for diffusion. The concentrated purples up here have more free energy, less stable, greater capacity to change. As the change occurs, once the purples have dispersed, they become less able to do any work, have less free or potential energy, and are more stable. The same is true for glucose. Keep that in mind for the next two chapters.